Hi, good morning. Welcome to CIO Leadership Live. I'm Mary Fran Johnson, the Executive Director of CIO Programs here at IDG, and I am very privileged today to be interviewing Cynthia Stoddard, who is the Senior Vice President and CIO of Adobe Systems. Cynthia joined this $7 billion global tech provider in June of 2016. And she brought along with her more than 25 years of business experience and IT leadership expertise from roles at NetApp, Safeway Grocery Chain, and the NOL Group, a global transportation and logistics company. Now, Adobe, as we all know, is a very well-known tech industry player, the inventor of software solutions such as Acrobat and Photoshop and many more. And about five years ago, Adobe made the kind of shift that so many of your companies have underway today, where they moved from the more traditional business model, in their case as an on-premise software, desktop software provider, to a cloud-based, essentially a cloud-based version of itself and all its products. Today, subscriptions through their cloud offerings account for 80% of Adobe's revenue. Now, enabling that level of business transformation has meant that the IT group, which is around 1,000 people internally and then several hundred more in contract and additional resources, the IT group had to evolve to a next-gen technology organization that was focused on doing business in the cloud. And as I'm, we're going to be talking about today, there are a whole lot of different skills and capabilities that need to come along with that. And like many of our guests here on Leadership Live, Cindy's CIO role has actually expanded outside the traditional kind of duties and capabilities that we associate with being the Chief Information Officer. She actually has the entire cloud operations business unit at Adobe reporting into her, as well as the entire tech organization. And one of her top focus uh, areas for IT innovation, which we'll be talking about quite a bit today, includes leveraging machine learning and artificial intelligence as both a product and a business enabler. So welcome. It's so great to have you here. It's great to be here. Thank you for having me. You're very welcome. Well, let's right, dive right in. I'm always fascinated when I encounter that dual role where you're a CIO. I, th I think of it as the CIO plus roles. Mm -hmm. And you are running the cloud operations business, which from what you've told me is more akin to running an engineering business than a classic business ops. Um, but talk a little bit about how that dual role, how is that how does that drive your day to day? So I love my dual role, mm -hmm. and uh, what cloud ops, uh, what the role and what I do, and you know, as part of cloud ops, is it runs all the operations for the SaaS based um, businesses that you that you were talking about. Yes. You know, our Creative Cloud, Photoshop, our Document Cloud, all of the above. That eighty percent of revenue. Yeah, that yes. eighty that eighty percent of revenues. So there's a strong um, consumer and customer focus, which I absolutely love mm -hmm. because we have to provide a set of resilience uh, services. They can't go down. Right. So I work with my um, operations teams uh, to make sure that, you know, that we have everything, you know, in order to keep everything, you know, highly resilient, up and running, mm -hmm. and provide that great experience to the, uh, you know, to our customer. Yeah. And it's a perfect complement to the other side of my role, you know, okay. the CIO role, because it really provides an end-to-end -end view. If you think about what mm -hmm. we do with cloud ops, it's the external facing services. Mm -hmm. All those external Internal-facing services have to connect in to some internal services, you know, for order processing, for revenue recognition. Mm -hmm. So I have the whole total into in view and can, you know, help the experience all the way through the customer journey. Yeah. Well, and that's always a very interesting thing about the CIO role. We often refer to it as the helicopter view mm -hmm. because CIOs internally to their companies have that end-to-end -end view. You know, what all the different departments and the business needs are, but in a case like this, you've got the end-to-end -end view of both internally and externally. Right. And interesting. How do you think this has changed or shape, shaped your CIO role? So um, I would say that it um, it's changed the role mm -hmm. by really taking um, learnings from both sides mm -hmm. and bringing them together. Sure. Uh, you know, the when you when you look at the engineering component, um, and operations there, people tend to th look at things through a different lens. Mm -hmm. And I would say that, you know, the if you look at it through the IT lens, it's a little bit separate. Mm 
What I have now is the end to end, and I can actually look at it and say, how can we bring the best learnings from IT into the cloud ops world and vice mm -hmm. versa? How can we learn from cloud ops and bring it in? And when I see some of the things that we've been doing in IT, like um, learning, uh, machine learning mm -hmm. and automation, and then I go over to cloud ops and see what they're doing with some of the tooling and monitoring, mm -hmm. and you think you can bring them together, it becomes extremely powerful, really yeah. powerful. Well, I imagine that it's also very inspiring for your teams, for the IT, uh, your internal IT people, because they get a different view on another part, uh, other parts of the company. That's right. They do mm -hmm. get a different view, and um, also they're getting a different, uh, different perspective on how to approach things. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, from a more you know engineering point of view. Yeah. So we bring that those learnings in, and I have to say, on the cloud ops side, it's been a real eye opener for them also. Okay. Because they had no idea exactly what does IT do. Mm -hmm. And it's like, wow, we didn't know that you actually did engineering support or we didn't know that, you know, you actually did build outs and data centers and stuff like this. Yeah. So as they're learning more and more about what an IT portfolio is for a company, mm -hmm. you know, there's their eyes are open. So if you look at the people perspective, mm -hmm. you know, you can give additional career path and learning and, you know, kind of cross pollinate between the yes. different organizations. Yes. Well, I've I've. Uh, thought for many years that all of the focus we've had on bringing IT more deeply into the business and all the business collaboration, that it, it is, of course, career enhancing and eye opening on the IT side, but I think equally as much on the business side. Mm -hmm. You know, that that final realization that it's not IT and the rest of the business, That's right. it's uh, it, it is IT as part of the business. That's and right. That's exactly right. And yeah. I think that if you look at IT today, mm -hmm. you know, IT is a business within mm -hmm. every business. So, um, you know, the days of having IT kind of behind a wall, yeah. you know, and, you know, and being order takers. The guys in the basement. The guys yeah. in the basement, mm -hmm. you know, pulling cables and things like that. Yeah. That's totally, that's totally out. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. You have to really collaborate and understand what your business is. And then IT technology is pervasive all over within yes. the business. You know, my philosophy has always been, let's be an enabler. Let's mm -hmm. understand, you know, where IT can help and let's enable the business to be able to use IT or technology by themselves. Okay. Yeah. Well, we talked a little bit um, earlier about how different the role has become for CIOs in tech companies specifically. Mm -hmm. Because I think a lot of your colleagues out in banking and insurance and the other industries uh, think that it must be um, a, a wonderland of all the budget you want, all the technology <laughs> you want, all the talent you can get. It seems like you're living inside the companies that provide them with technology. So they probably have this kind of, I guess, rose-tinted glasses when they look at your role. Um, so let's talk about what the reality is, now, especially now that every company is thinking of itself as we're a tech company that happens to fly airplanes. Yeah. You know, so that's very cool now to everybody to be a tech company. Company. But um, what is it? What is it like, really, to be the CIO at a tech company these days? So um, you know, I think that in many ways, mm -hmm. being a CIO at a tech company is similar to being CIO at other companies too. You know, retail, mm -hmm. um, financial services. You're saying tech companies are regular companies, like we the rest are, of them. We <laughs> are. We are regular companies. Yeah. We have budgets. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> we everything doesn't come. You, you know, don't have free. a blank check. No, you we don't have blank that. checks. Uh -huh. You know, we have to add value to the business. Yeah. So you know, a lot of the challenges I, I would say are pretty are pretty similar across a lot of verticals. Mm -hmm. You know, I think where um, I think where maybe it's could be a little bit different is when you start, you know, looking at, you know, who our audience is internally. Okay. And I even think that that's changing in some respects. But, you know, internally, we have engineers, you know, we have a lot of high tech people, mm -hmm. you know, within using our, you know, using our services. Right. So if you think about that, then, you know, everybody's a technology 
expert. Yes. So I would say that that is a little bit different. Mm -hmm. Although I would say that even in non-tech companies, everybody is becoming a technology expert only because technology is so pervasive in their personal yeah. lives. So the expectations mm -hmm. are higher. Yeah. Um, you know, people tend to um, want to create, be creative in their own worlds. Yeah. So you know, the collaboration, working with you know within your you know your business units with your business partners, has to be a lot more. Yeah. Um, because you need to bring those ideas to the to the table so that they can understand what you can do and mm -hmm. how you can help them. Well, in many ways, it's one of those blessing and a curse situations mm. where the more people use technology and all their devices, the more they think they know just as much about IT as the IT people do. I think it's a little delusional yeah. on the part of you know the regular run-of-the-mill users because there's so much behind the scenes with the integration of everything and making it work and yeah. all of that. And it's, it's an interesting conundrum now where IT is so popular and everyone thinks they understand exactly how it works. And I I think it's probably much worse with engineers. Yeah, it, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, there there is that, but um, you know, at Adobe, mm -hmm. one of the things that uh, we believe is that innovation can come from anywhere in the company. So we actually, you know, open it up. Yeah. And I would say, if you have those right. open lines of communication. Uh, one of the things that you can do is you can harvest those ideas. Mm -hmm. So a couple of things that um, that we've done is you know, we have what we call an interest program. Mm -hmm. And what an interest program is, if you're in a business unit and you, you know, you see or um, you want to use a particular SaaS solution that you think is going to help your business process. Mm -hmm. If you if you can abide to some of our interest uh, governance capabilities, which means, you know, the security around data, how you use, how you work with the vendors and things mm -hmm. like that, will entrust you to be the custodian of that SaaS solution. So we've done oh. things like um, created APIs mm -hmm. so that you can get to your data um, so that everything is self-service in certain situations. So this is what I mean by, you know, everybody, you know, everybody within the company can have a have an idea. Yes. And then if you use it within a certain set of governance and framework, uh -huh. then, you know, you can enable people to be the custodians of their own technology. Well, and if you get them inside that governance framework, it it pretty much removes the shadow IT problem. That's right. Essentially, I've heard some more forward-thinking, forward-looking CIOs refer to shadow IT as shadow innovation. Yeah. Uh, because it's ideas coming and the fact that you um, have the tools and you can access them. So it's just, it's not that you don't restrict everyone inside Adobe to just use Adobe tools. That's right. That's okay. right. Mm -hmm. And on that, you know... Um, I really feel that different roles need different types of tools. Ah. So one of the um, one mm -hmm. of the areas that we worked on is um, actually taking anything that is employee facing mm -hmm. and putting it in one area. And what I mean by that is, if you think about your employee facing tools as your collaboration tools, mm -hmm. um, your video, um, anything that the employee uses in order to do their role, yeah. we centralized it into um, one group. You know, a, a direct report to me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, within that last year, one of the things that we worked on is saying, let's look at our employees and let's yeah. look at the type of personas that they have. Because oh, okay. different personas may need different tools. So we've come up with four different personas. You know, mm -hmm. one is a builder. We have a large group of engineers. Okay. We have, you know, enablers, which would be, you know, our back office, finance, people like that. You didn't, have, want, you didn't want to call them the codependents. No, we don't want to call them codependents. <laughs> so they're enablers. They're enablers. Okay. Um, we also have um, communicators mm -hmm. and customer facing. Oh, and what you find is that those four personas will work in different ways. They have different needs for collaboration tools. Mm -hmm. They have different needs for how mobile they are. They're different types of desktops and things like that. That's interesting. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. so now we're gearing the tools within the organization to those different personas. So when we work with the employees, when we bring things in, mm -hmm. we think about, okay, what kind of persona is Mary Fran? Yes. And what kind of tools should we bring to the table? And how should we help? Help to make her more productive versus mm -hmm. saying, okay, I have this one particular laptop and everybody's going to use yeah. it. Yeah, and here's all the tools on it, most of which you're never going to figure out how to use. Exactly, yeah. and I think that the one size fits mm -hmm. all kind of breeds some of that shadow IT. 
Okay. Okay. That makes total sense. Yeah. This also sounds like the personas, that's something that any company could adopt. Absolutely. Absolutely. Any company could adopt. And actually, when I talk to my fellow CIOs Mm -hmm. and customers, they're quite interested in the personas and how we're going about doing that. Yeah. How did you develop them? And this sounds like the sort of thing that marketing departments do. It's not something you necessarily expect the CIO to be in charge of. So how did it all come about? So we partnered with our um, employee experience group. So mm-hmm. our um, employee experience group would be called um, HR. Okay. In, that in, would have been my guess. Right. Okay. Yeah. okay. <laughs> but we're an experienced company, so mm-hmm. we care very much about our employee experience because happy yeah. happy employees also make happy customers. Mm-hmm. Um and we, you know, we had um, surveys, we ran focus groups, mm-hmm. and, you know, we just did a lot of, you know, work to figure out, you know, the tools and how people work. And that's how we segmented, you know, the type of work within the organization into these four different personas. Interesting. Yeah, you're correct that marketing yeah. groups do a lot of that. Mm-hmm. But it was important for us to understand the makeup and the identities of the of the organization so that we could better service yeah. them. Is the largest group the builders? Yeah. Yeah, the largest yes, group largest is the, the builders. Yeah, and the mm-hmm. second largest would be the customer facing. Of course. Yeah. Yes, that uh-huh. totally makes sense. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you've got communicators. Right. And the fourth group is? Enablers. Enablers. Yes. All right, now that sounds a little squishy. What are enablers? So <laughs> enablers help others do their jobs. So if you okay. think about back office, you know, you take a customer mm-hmm. order. It has to be processed through order processing. It has to become oh. revenue. You know, it has to become an entitlement. It's more the business operations. It, exactly. They that's are exactly. the enablers. That's that, right. And that mm-hmm. is just fit. That's very yeah. cool. Yeah. Um, let's talk a little bit about... The IT organization and kind of its own journey, Mm because we often do talk about the customer journey in these uh, CIO Leadership Live interviews, and and we'll definitely get to that. But the I don't have very many companies that come in that have reached such a stage of maturity with their their huge business transformation, Mm -hmm. going from an your product was all on premises, and then five years ago you made the switch. This is before you arrived because you arrived two years ago. So uh, talk a little bit about the before and after, kind of what you found when you arrived two years ago and what has changed under your leadership. Sure, we can. I can absolutely talk about that. So when I arrived, I have to say it was actually a pleasure to join mm-hmm. Adobe because IT wasn't broken. Mm-hmm. You know, I've gone into other organizations where IT is broken. You have to repair the relationships with the business. A lot of CIOs are drawn to that. They love a burning building. Yeah. They Let d- me run in and fix things. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's right. Yes. That's exactly right. <laughs> well, IT wasn't broken at Adobe. Um, now, IT, I would say, was lacking a mission, um, lacking vision. Um, it we had a very, um, I would say, good foundation mm-hmm. because we had made the switch from being packaged software over to SaaS. Yes. So there had been a lot of work that was done in order to move, you know, from I would say a traditional environment yeah. over to a services based uh, environment. So a lot of the heavy lifting got done in those first three years. Yeah, a lot mm-hmm. of the heavy lifting got done. I would say that the services environment was uh, more complex than it needed to be. Mm-hmm. So so we actually did go through a simplification of that. Great. Um, because of the complexity of the services environment, things were fragmented. Mm-hmm. You know, there was a lot of fragmentation. There wasn't clear accountability. So we went through a process to um, bring teams together. So, you know, the employee experience team I talked about, you know, we formed that traditional, mm-hmm. you know, the uh, INO, infrastructure operations, a solutioning team. So brought these different groups together with clear purpose and clear identity. And the other thing um, when I joined that I did is kind of did this listening tour with IT and the business to mm-hmm. understand exactly, you know, what was working, what was not working, all the way down to the individual contributor level of mm-hmm. IT. Mm-hmm. And then figured out, hey, you know, we need a, we need to have kind of a mission. We need to have a, a cry here that we can all rally around. We need a tagline. A tagline. I and love it, an IT group with like a mission statement. And Yeah. yeah. And our, our, our goal is really to, you know, 
unleash the unleash the full potential mm -hmm. of you know of everyone which is our you know our employees our mm -hmm. customers and our partners you know again we're a creative company right. so we want to position us to do our to do that and mm -hmm. that's what was really brought IT together in addition to that we said okay how are we going to do that mm -hmm. and we said okay we're going to have cloud like characteristics in our dna so we're yes, going to be. Yes, you mentioned that, and I yes. haven't heard that before. It's a very cool phrase: cloud-like characteristics in your DNA. Yes. Okay. Yes. Explain. Uh, so you yeah. know, you think about you think about clouds, mm -hmm. and you think about um, dealing with clouds. So dealing with Amazon, or you know, dealing yep. with other cloud providers like Azure, it's really easy to do things with them, right? So you can. Yes, it is designed to be easy. It's designed to be easy. Mm -hmm. It's self-service. You can scale. Um, you know, you can, you know, expand on demand. So when I talk mm -hmm. to my organization, it's like, we really want to be easy to deal with. We want to take oh. ourselves out of the equation. Mm -hmm. And when I talk about this, it's not just the operations roles that this pertains to. It's every single role within IT. Because if you're an individual mm -hmm. contributor in a business ops function or if you're in a solution group, you can think about how you're impacting or working with the people that you do day in and day out. Mm -hmm. You can say, how do I make it easier for people to interact with me? How do I design solutions that are self-service? How do I ensure that I have the right scalability so when we have peaks, you know, mm -hmm. in the business that we're able to scale up and go down? And I would say that it's been amazing to see the change within IT because people have really rallied around that. Yeah. yeah people love a mission. Yeah, they you love know, a mission. mission that they can be part of and contribute yeah. to. And, yeah, and they yeah. look at their own worlds and mm -hmm. they say, okay, how do I, how do I change my own world yeah. in order to actually further that mission within IT. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and something you said actually reminded me, I forgot to tell our watchers who are out there now on Twitter, if you would like to ask your own questions of uh, Cindy here, please go ahead and tweet them to us. We are watching the Twitter feed and would be I'd be happy to serve as the, as the, the servant of your tweet in. So <laughs> please go ahead and feel free to ask questions as we go along here. Um, as you went about, what's a specific example, something that shows that IT mission, unleash the creativity in our employees and customers? What's a, give me a specific example, like an anecdote around that, where how it used to be and how it is now. Yeah, so um, I, can, I can do that. So an example of this um, would be, uh, let's, I can give you actually a couple of examples. Mm -hmm. So we have... Um, we have a Hadoop infrastructure for our data. Mm -hmm. And, you know, with the amount of data that you have within, you know, within Hadoop, within our, our data lakes, it took a tremendously long time to test. And mm -hmm. the testing results, you know, um, aren't or weren't exactly what we would want 100%. You, know, you weren't, weren't thrilled. Yeah, no. I weren't thrilled. Mm -hmm. yeah. So on one of my visits with my team over in India, kind of talked about that and said, you know, maybe you could build something, you know, to automate it, or maybe you could, mm -hmm. you know, you know, spend some time looking at the problem. And, you know, four months later, I went back and they had built a, um, a Hadoop test framework, mm -hmm. which actually cut the testing time by 90 percent and automated wow. the testing through the entire process. Now, if you can cut the testing time by 90 percent, that means you can Test a lot more, and the yes. quality goes up. Yep. So that would be um, that would be an example of how we kind of unleashed the you know the creativity within the organization. Mm -hmm. You unleash that, then you know the information that comes out of the mm -hmm. data analytics is far more for our business people. They tend to unleash their creativity because they can see more information. Yeah. And then it's just kind of a ripple effect through the entire mm -hmm. organization when you do things like that. that so that so would neat. be that would be one example of how we've done that. Okay. What are some of the, as you were restructuring and refining the IT organization, talk a little bit about some of the new roles that you created or the new skill sets that you maybe cast more emphasis on. So some of the new roles um, in you know areas of uh, more emphasis definitely in the employee experience area. Mm -hmm. I would say that that was um, underserved mm -hmm. before. 
Um, you know, a lot of companies, including ourselves, have spent you know a lot of time with the experience that our external customers have. Not really enough time on the on the internal mm-hmm. on the internals. So I like to spend a lot of time you know with the employees and you really really looking at how do we you know better serve the internal employees. Okay. So really upgrading and looking at the internal. That would be one area we focused on. Another area that we focused on is in the architecture area. Hmm. Um, so how do we how do we bring the concepts of enterprise architecture into the organization? Hmm. We had um, those are tough hires too. They're the re- really tough. They're the, really hard to find. My friends in the recruiting community, I, they just their most difficult searches are for enterprise architects. Yes. Yeah, they're very talented yes. and, um, yeah, very, very talented people and very hard to They're often combine. a little peculiar from what I do. Well, they're very, very uh, – they're often the individual contributors. That's right. The ultimate individual right. contributors. Right, because yeah. they're thinkers, right? Yeah, they're they thinkers are. They and, are. And they're, they're kind of out there. They're serious brainiacs. Right, they're, yep. they're mm-hmm. out there. So mm-hmm. so we created an enterprise architecture discipline. Mm-hmm. Um, so we've staffed that up. And that's – you know, that looks at, you know, roadmaps. It looks at our – customer journey. It looks at how we're looking at data for the organization. Yeah. So I would say that that's been an area where, um, you know, we focus a lot over the past, you know, year and a half in order okay. to kind of bring that up. Yeah. Yeah. So that's been another area. Well, it's nice to hear too, because oftentimes when I ask CIOs that question, the, the first answer is that they created a liaison position like a business relationship manager because of that um, a separate islands problem with IT, mm-hmm. that they needed more collaboration with the rest of the business. But it sounds like these roles actually were part of reorganizing the way you were working inside IT as well. That's right. That's yeah. right. Yeah, it's within IT, yeah. Mm-hmm. And the enterprise architecture role is really interesting. Um, it'd be a great role to have because it mm-hmm. does work within um, IT, but it also has a strong link to the business for the business process mm-hmm. and additionally into our engineering groups because we want to ensure that our um, technology choices are very complementary to what we're doing in engineering. Okay. Yeah. That makes perfect sense. Um Let's talk a little bit about the kind of your top, I always ask CIOs this as well, what are your top business and technology initiatives? What are the things that are the biggest accomplishments that you hope to make in the coming year? Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So I look at that. you know, by looking at really four different four different pillars that we're focusing on as an organization, mm-hmm. the one the first one is operational excellence. Okay. And operational excellence has to do a lot with the role that I have with cloud ops and also mm-hmm. the IT infrastructure. Of course. So looking at um, always on, how mm-hmm. do we become always on um, more so than we are today? How do we look at injecting different technologies into our IT and our cloud ops operations? So how do mm-hmm. we look Look at AI, ML, self-learning, all mm-hmm. of these technologies, so that you know we can scale as an organization, scale smartly, and also continue to deliver a high level of service to the organization. Okay. So that's one one area. The second area is all about experience. So there's two areas of experience. The you know the first is our customer experience and looking at the end-to-end journey our customers have and then you know injecting different tools and and you know um, processes there that will you know make our customer experience better okay. and the second is the employee experience that we talked about yes. really what I refer to as advancing the inside so one pillar on um, experience the third pillar is all about data and Mm -hmm. insights and not just about dashboards and looking at the rear view mirror but looking at how do we how do we um, become proactive how do we actually look at data with insights in mind actionable insights in mind so we've uh built what we call the data-driven operating model Mm -hmm. concept using our you know our data warehouse our data lakes in order to do Mm -hmm. that so that's another area of focus and the fourth area is all about what we call our business platform Mm -hmm. or advancing the business platform so this would be our back office solutions that we use Mm -hmm. it could be anything um from getting compliant in GDPR and some of the revenue recognition rules to actually advancing how do we support our enterprise customers. Okay. 
Well, I'm very excited to tell you that we have a question from Twitter. We do. We oh, do. wow. Well, that's, I, that is very is, exciting. It is, because this is, I think, our 10th version, our tenth episode of CIO Leadership Live. And this, I think, is our first question oh, that wow. actually came from Twitter. I'm honored. <laughs> I know. You should be. And it's a darn good one. It says, Cynthia, what are the new attributes of senior leaders who are leading? What are the kind of attributes you need from your senior leaders to lead digital transformation efforts and to really change the paradigms? Yeah, so that's excellent. The, yeah, it is yeah. a great question. Mm-hmm. So um, the first thing that I would say from senior leaders is to have an open mind, right? Um, because uh, you, yes, yeah. yes, yes, mm-hmm. yeah. You you have to kind of get out of the um, IT mindset where you know we mm. we have solutions and we're going to deliver you solutions to we really have everything's a problem that needs to be solved. That's right. Yeah. To kind of like okay, let mm-hmm. me listen. Let me listen uh, to what your problems are. Yeah. Um, if you think about what we've done a lot in IT in the past, it's been very much focused on inside out. Mm-hmm. You know, really kind of tuning up our processes and you know understanding. How how we become more efficient and effective as an organization right, right, and yeah. really, you know, productivity enhancing all That's the time. Right. Yeah. So mm-hmm. I need leaders or I think the next generation of leaders is really focused on outside in. Okay. Right. Understanding the customer, Mm -hmm. understanding the customer journey, listening to that and bringing those insights in and really to, you know, look at the what we do as an organization from the customer point of view versus the inside out. Mm -hmm. So leaders that listen, leaders that are open minded and leaders that really understand the customer journey. How do you encourage or how do you skill up people that may be at senior leadership levels uh, on your team, but maybe they've always enjoyed just doing their own work and keeping their heads down sort of thing? Because I I always remember that a lot of IT people purposely did not go into marketing and Mm -hmm. communications because they really liked working with technology and they liked the fact that they could do their own thing. So it's a mindset change for IT overall. You know, this kind of invasion of all the communications and marketing savvy and skills that need to come in. So how do you train? How do you help people? uh, How how do you help them like this new direction? Yeah. Yes. So that's that's Mm -hmm. a great question. Um, I think that um, what I've liked to do, you know, I've always kind of thought of myself as a as a customer facing CIO yes and mm-hmm. um, I kind of you know branded myself uh, with that and by that I spend time with customers and I understand yes, what I their challenges are mm-hmm. what their challenges are so I like to bring those challenges back those learnings back to my team mm-hmm. and I actually um, I actually challenge them to talk to customers I challenge them to go to you know different seminars and things like that Mm -hmm. and actually outside of the immediate area because I think it's important for for them to have contacts in other industry groups not just high tech but other industry groups because Mm -hmm. you learn from how other industry groups you know do things yes and what their challenges are so really kind of branch out outside of their comfort zone Mm -hmm. and really look at you know how do I get how do I get my own view of the customer how do i see what is maybe going on in financial services versus high tech Mm -hmm. you know kind of build those networks well and i know some cios that are purposely sending some of their it people to conferences where they're going to be surrounded by marketers you know there's a lot of enterprise marketing conferences out there and so there certainly is is a a wealth of choices to make um so it's more than just sending them to the adobe briefing center that's right to meet with customers and talk about product features that's right much broader Mm -hmm. yeah absolutely broader excellent the um Emerging technology trends, the things that you think are most impacting both Adobe's business and also your customers' business. What are some of the what are some of the obvious choices there? Of the well, I think some of the obvious choices are talking about, you know, machine learning, okay. artificial intelligence. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we've had, you know, we, Adobe, have had, um, you know, the um, AI built into our products. I, we've referred to it in the past as the Adobe Magic. Mm-hmm. But what we're doing on the product side is really um, taking that. You know, we have our AI ML kind of framework, which we call mm-hmm. Sensei, and you know, in extracting it and building more into mm-hmm. our products so that customers can use it. You know, in as a framework. You know, 
in their businesses as well. Yeah. So that's going on on the product side. Within the IT side, um, you know, we use the you know machine learning and artificial intelligence as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, talked about you know a little bit about the test factory that we built. You know, right. that's a lot of automation. Mm -hmm. But we've also built what we call a self-healing framework. And kind of the um, you know the underlying premise there is if you have to fix something mm -hmm. in operations, you know when things are running and things like that, if you have to fix it, that means you can automate it. And if you can automate it, okay. then the framework can learn and it make itself better and add more to it. So is this an application development area that um, often when I hear self healing, it's usually about networks, but this is much broader. It is much broader. Okay. Network is a great example. So if uh -huh. you take the network example and then you bring that network example, say, into your applications that are running and providing services, mm -hmm. things break. So you might have, you know, something yeah. that, um, you know, space Space might be getting full, or you might be getting uh, alerted out. Not space the final frontier. Not space no. the final <laughs> frontier, yeah. Storage space, um, things yeah. like that. So there are a lot of things that can happen mm -hmm. while your services are running. So what this does is it takes the same concepts that you would self-heal in a network mm -hmm. and brings that to the application layer. And it'll oh. fix things. So, oh. for example, you know, we've done a lot of, you know, looking at our self-healing framework. And mm -hmm. before, on average, it would take a, a person, mm -hmm. um, a technician, about 30 minutes to fix an issue. Okay. Uh, with the self-healing framework, the technology can fix it in, like, slightly over a minute. Okay. So there's a mm -hmm. real time saving there, mm -hmm. you know, of the of the 30 minutes. But more importantly, you are you are bringing a return to service or you're improving your service to the ultimate customer by about 29 minutes. So there's instead of That's having pretty a, significant, it's, a, it's yeah, huge. Yeah. It's absolutely huge. Mm -hmm. So the, you know, the quality of service goes up and the amount of time that technicians have to spend manually fixing things goes down. Mm -hmm. And then they become the technicians that actually get, you know, exposure to the AI, the ML mm -hmm. and start to write this, these frameworks. So they, you know, their skills are being expanded and their knowledge is being expanded mm -hmm. as well. Now, this work that you're doing in machine learning and AI, this is with additional outside tools. This is not just all Adobe gear. That's right. That's okay. right. And we mm -hmm. use uh, within my organization for that, mm -hmm. uh, we make use heavy use of uh, open source. So mm -hmm. bringing different open source tools together. Yes. And, you know, putting them together in order to create these frameworks. Yeah. Is your uh, approach to app dev essentially all agile at this point, or do you still have a mix of agile and waterfall? So we have a mix. Okay. Um, you know, I would love to say that everything could be done um, in agile, but in reality, any when you have with a, a legacy, legacy <laughs> I know, it's right, just any a company legacy. that's older than five years right. has always going to have, I think, exactly. some sort of waterfall going on. That's right. That's right. So we do yeah. have some waterfall going on as yeah. well. We don't, you don't hear a lot about agile uh -huh. with ERP systems, for instance, right. although some of the processes, in fact, you had mentioned that you've got uh, some AI enabled ERP solutions. Yes, Which this is the f and and maybe I'm just not up on the technology as much as I ought to do. But you mentioned that uh, you've got using AI to take over some routine tasks in ERP. Yes, uh, what's an example of that? Explain what that means. So okay. yeah, we're using artificial intelligence and also RPA. You know the robotic yep. process automation. Mm -hmm. um, we've been experimenting and are now implementing uh, in the procurement area. Okay. So there are you know contracts and things like that that need to be set up um, mm -hmm. and. It's a lot of manual effort, and we found by using you know the automation, we can reduce the manual effort by about eighty percent. So instead of spending you know like twelve hundred hours doing the efforts, we've gotten it down to slightly over two hundred. So again, you know mm -hmm. it frees up time mm -hmm. on the you know our, with our business partners so yes. that they can do other value added work as opposed to kind of some of the tedious work that they do. Right. So right. yeah, experimenting on many fronts with it to say, okay, how do we make IT more efficient? How do we take those same you know tips and techniques over to the business and work with them mm -hmm. um, and help them become you know 
more efficient in their yeah. business processes. Well, and I tend to think of those sorts of approaches as everyday innovation. Mm-hmm. You know, the sort of the the just the constant improvement cycle that yeah. goes on in IT. And I, I think there's probably much more beneficial focus on that now, on, yes. on what IT organizations can do. And one of the things we had uh, we talked about earlier about how you – helped your group make a shift to being a product focused delivery in IT yes. versus a project kind of focus. I've had conversations with a lot of other CIOs about that where they're trying to get everybody out of the project management mode where you finish this one piece and then you just move on to the next one and have kind of more of an ownership across a product. Explain how you made that shift and what it means at Adobe. Okay, so we've made that shift in um, one of my areas and now we're moving it out into some of the other areas. Mm-hmm. We started in our data analytics area. Okay. And um, you're absolutely right. On a product or a project focus, excuse me, project focus, you have um, lots of discussions about, you know, here's a capability, here's a list of requirements. And I would say in that area, your business users are very reluctant to let anything go mm-hmm. because they want to get everything into that one project because they're afraid they'll never get a project right, again. Right. Right. We have yeah. to get this money and spend right. it right away. Right. That's right. We'll yeah. get it. If if you move to a product mindset yeah. and you have a roadmap that spans a year plus, mm-hmm. people will understand when their capability is coming. Okay. So the conversation with your business users totally changes to not one wow. of, okay, I need this included now and we can't start until you know you commit mm-hmm. to it, to one of Let's work on our, you know, our roadmap over a year and let's figure out when it makes sense in order to inject this capability. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, both on the IT side, we can build it. On the business side, we can prepare for it. And then it becomes a rolling discussion and a, and a rolling, rolling delivery mechanism. Yeah. And it's totally different than, OK, I need to negotiate these 10 items into a project. Yeah. Um, and I can't start until we get the negotiations complete to mm-hmm. one of, OK, let's look at the next year and let's figure out how we're going to you know deliver the roadmap in an agile manner yeah. and you know and prepare for the capabilities well and I, I'm thinking how uh, you know how beneficial that feels definitely on the business side from the IT side uh, it helps shift that mindset where they want to make everything perfect before it launches That's and right. getting to that uh, I think Bill Gates has talked for years about the 80 percent getting to 80 percent that in uh, various tech you know, well-known tech giants have said stuff like, what is it? Perfection is the enemy of good. That's right. And That's right. Yeah. 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 And how, how did you find the mindset, say, two years ago versus now? How have you uh, been able to kind of advance that? Mm-hmm. So I would say that the, the product mindset or the moving to product definitely helps with the, uh, mm. with the mindset. Um, you know, it changes people the can, expectations, doesn't it? Cha- it it yeah. changes the expectation, and it also, from an execution standpoint, says, "Let's go out and try it. Mm-hmm. Let's see if it works." Because maybe some of this stuff doesn't work 100 percent of the time, and we shouldn't invest, you know, mm-hmm. the 110 percent. We should only be investing, you know, the 70 or 80 percent to get it there and try it out. Yeah. So that whole experimentation really works quite nicely. Um, I would say that still in some areas of IT, there is, um, you know, the mindset of perfection mm-hmm. um, that we kind of have to get over. And in some cases, I would say that it's okay to have that in IT yeah. because certain areas, <laughs> you know, if you get into rev- revenue recognition and some of yeah. the finance areas, yeah. you want that level of scrutiny and detail and perfection. Exactly. Yeah. Those areas where you don't want to necessarily be doing agile processes. That's you know, right, right. All the regulatory. You had mentioned earlier the... Uh, I think it's either the Entrust model or yes. the Entrust model that you put in place. Explain more about that. What is that? Is that a program or is that a particular approach to certain kinds of issues? So I would call it more an approach versus a program. Okay. Um, and the approach is that, you know, if there are SaaS solutions that, mm-hmm. you know, would be good point solutions that organizations um, use. And I'll use our legal department. Um, actually, many legal departments, I would say, are mm-hmm. in the in the same boat where they need a lot of automation mm-hmm. um, in order to further their processes. So there's a lot of great solutions on the market. Um 
However, you need to integrate those solutions with some of the core back office. So what we've done is we've created APIs, we've created a governance model mm -hmm. that allow our users to go out, uh, procure a SaaS solution, and then live within the framework of governance, use the APIs, and then self-manage that solution mm -hmm. within their own department. Okay. Well, that sounds like a sounds like a pretty sensible approach, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It's um, you must put some of these things in place and think, huh? Why didn't we do that five years ago? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, yeah. <laughs> and you know, I like mm -hmm. to think of myself as an enabler, mm -hmm. um, you know, and help people use the technology that is available versus right. saying you have to come to IT in order to get it. Right. Which is why mm -hmm. one of the reasons why we have the cloud-like characteristics. Okay. Because I mm -hmm. want my organization to say, you know, let's take IT out of the equation. And I don't mean eliminate mm -hmm. IT. Mm -hmm. What I mean is take us out of the equation by equipping our business users with self-service, yeah. you know, things that they can, you know, use day in and day out to enable their own business mm -hmm. capabilities. And all that is that, well, and that's a essentially an IT foundation that is growing more into, through AI, machine learning, it's essentially getting to be a bigger part of the piece that no one ever has to notice. That's right. That's yeah. right. We don't want to be noticed. That would yeah. be ideal, right? Yeah. <laughs> is, is it, you can just go to a portal, yeah. you know, order. And it all just works. And it all just works. Yes. That's, that's, that's the vision, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Let's talk a little bit about your data analytics and governance mm -hmm. strategies, because I think that that's always very interesting to our audience. Do you have what you would describe as an enterprise data strategy? Yes. All yes, right. Yes, what, we do. What is it and what does that mean for you? So um, on the uh, data strategy, mm -hmm. you know, um, we refer to it as DDOM, which is a data-driven operating model. Okay. Um, because we want to and we have matured past, you know, looking at dashboards and mm -hmm. just having information to one of being able to be proactive and actually, you know, look into the future and, you know, make business decisions. And I would say mm -hmm. that the core tenants that kind of support this are commonality of data. Mm -hmm. So making sure that we have common data definitions across different business units. Uh, um, so if you think not about... not so easy to get no, to. No, <laughs> it isn't. It isn't. It isn't easy. So if yeah. you think of just the definition of customer... Or the definition yep. of product. You know, mm -hmm. I can go down the list. It takes a lot of time in order to get that common definition, but it's really important because once you get to that point, then you can you can you know share. Everything else gets easier. Everything else yeah. gets easier. So that's one. The other one is consistency of measurement. So if you think about how you measure different, mm -hmm. you know, metrics within the business, you know, if you have a consistency of the definition of how you're going to measure it across mm -hmm. the business areas, yeah. then you have common language. So common language is really, really important to have. Mm -hmm. So that would be the second one. The third one is what I would refer to as actionable insights. Mm -hmm. um, you can display That's a lot the of holy information. Grail. Yeah. Everybody loves that. Yeah. You can display a lot of information, but if you can't action it, yeah. then you know, you're not being proactive and I don't feel you're delivering that value to the business. You're just pouring more data out of the hose and it's not necessarily giving anybody a drink That's right. That's <laughs> of what right. they want. Right. So yeah. being able to have those insights, understand what's going on you know, maybe within the customer journey, mm -hmm. and then saying, this is how I can change it for the future, as opposed to, oh, this happened in the past, and you know, maybe I could have yeah. done something differently. The rear view mirror look. Exactly. Mm -hmm. is really important. And then the fourth area is really around governance. You mm -hmm. know, how do we how do we have a you know a virtual network of data stewards? How do they work together? How do we make sure that the information is handled, you know, consistently across the organization? Mm -hmm. What are our rules for engaging? Not trying to be a central group that does that, but really providing the overall enterprise governance and mm -hmm. then having it distributed more in a virtual manner across the enterprise. And does this require a governance committee or a meeting of some sort? Is there a regular meeting of the minds between the different business units? Because I know every time CIOs bring up governance, mm -hmm. I imagine they get a lot of sighing and eye rolling from their business colleagues because it sounds like some boring old IT thing. You know, yeah. why do we have to talk about this? So how do you how, how do you socialize that? How do you make S governance exciting? So <laughs> or appealing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure it'll ever be exciting. No, yeah, but you're right. I, That's I a bridge people... too far. Yeah. 
Yeah. I think people have bought into it. Mm -hmm. So we actually started as part of our um, data-driven operating model. Okay. And, um, the DDOM. DDOM, mm -hmm. yes. And it's kind of like one of these things, what's in it for me. Yeah. So if you understand um, mm -hmm. the governance framework, if you understand the data definitions, how you can play, then your data that you use is going to become that much more actionable for your business unit. So, oh, okay. so we started kind of small and expanding mm -hmm. out with the metrics and the information that so we that needed way to use. So there's something in it for people. Exactly. Yeah. As opposed to saying, mm -hmm. let's take everybody from the organization that has anything to do with data and bring them into a room and have these big governance mm -hmm. meetings. We didn't do that. We said, okay, how do we, how do we get the people involved that, you know, have a need for data driven operating right model mm -hmm. right now? And then how do we expand it over time with more of a virtual network, not a sit down, we're going to go through every data element and figure out, you know, mm -hmm. how it's going to be governed. Okay. And then we have tools and data glossaries and things that are really self-serve, mm -hmm. right? Back to self-serve. Back yes. to self-serve mm -hmm. where people can, you know, keep things up to date, understand who's the data steward. And really it becomes kind of this virtual organization. Is the goal to have the, the DDOM, the data-driven operating model, essentially encompass the entire company? Or is there always going to be other forms of the, how many operating models are there? So the data-driven mm -hmm. operating model, yes, will will be across the across the board mm -hmm. for both our, um, our consumer mid-market and then our enterprise business. Okay. Um, the second part of your question about will there be other forms? Mm -hmm. Yes, there will be other forms because we'll always have financial reporting to be done. Ah. So we need systems of record for financial reporting for SEC, of all course. that kind of great mm -hmm. stuff. Um, so I always see it as there'll be, you know, you know, different um, different flavors of reporting for the different needs in the organization. Okay, that makes total sense. Um, we talked a little bit. We've touched on innovation several times, especially when we were talking about using the machine learning and AI as product and business enablers. Um, you had mentioned when we talked before healing as a service mm -hmm. and how it saves time and shifts work out of the queue. Is that an official program? It just it sounded like all initial caps. You know, healing yeah. as a service. Yeah. So it is. Haas. Haas. We actually Haas. we call it Haas. Do you? Okay. Yes, we call it well, Haas. You call the other thing DDOM, so <laughs> right. why not, you know? <laughs> we do call it Haas, for All sure. Right. Yeah, so um, it started actually, you know, um, I would say in a little innovation camp in IT, trying to uh -huh. figure out how do we make things better? Mm -hmm. How do we, you know, simplify the complex and, you know, bring some you know, value add to the table? Um, is it a program? Yeah, I would say that it is an ongoing program. Okay. You know, we started small in one area, and now we're moving it into other areas of IT where we can, you know, self heal. We've actually moved it into our analytics area. Oh. You know, in order to process that data, yeah. a lot of data has to come in. We have to kind of munge it, it and be sorted and cleaned sorted and, and, clean, yeah, cleansed, and labeled all that kind of stuff and meta tagged like that. and yeah. Right. And when mm -hmm. and things can go wrong. So again, yeah. as you as you fix things, if you can fix it, you can self heal it and you can, you know, make it correct for the next go around. <laughs> so yes, absolutely. It's a program and I see that it's it's growing and it'll continue to look for area, other areas of opportunity. Yeah. And does this uh, thinking about and the approach to healing as a service, how does that translate in onto the product side? onto all that, the cloud operations, for instance, that reports to you? So within the um, cloud operations, we have a lot of automation there that mm -hmm. we actually use within that framework. But we're also looking at, um, actually, we're looking across both ways. We're looking at, from the IT perspective, how do we learn from the engineering mindset? Um, they tend to be very mature in areas such as DevOps and things like that. Mm -hmm. So how do we bring that into IT? And then with the complexities of IT, how do we bring some of that self-learning and those frameworks into cloud operations? Okay. So it's a two-way sharing, actually. Yeah. All right, good. Um, also, in in approaching innovation and in the way in your philosophy about it in the leadership tenets that you follow with it um, some CIOs take a structured approach to it like you have mentioned your the innovation camp mm -hmm. and I don't know is that actually a group um, that is has a specific name or or do you take a less structured approach to it? I so I would say, yeah, mine is really less structured. Okay. 
um, because innovation can come from many different areas. And, and we, it should. And it should. It yeah. should. Absolutely mm-hmm. should. So there's a lot of great ideas that come out. What I found is that people across IT will collaborate. You mm-hmm. might have somebody in an engineering group collaborating with somebody in an application group mm-hmm. in order to bring the ideas to life. Yeah. And that's exactly what we want them to do. Um, somebody asked me once, you know, um, you know, for some of the ML and AI, you know, do you look for an ROI? before you start an effort Oof, deadly and, huh exactly that's that's my th- that's my <laughs> yeah. thought because if you look for a return on investment how are you going to know what the possible is what the art of the possible is you're immediately is? getting all practical and you're immediately saying if you fail at this and you don't have an ROI then we're not going to be happy and that's anything that discourages experimentation and failure and moving forward essentially quashes innovation that's right that's right. Yeah, you, you think need that to be, would be obvious to people. Well, yeah, <laughs> not always. Yeah, yeah. yeah, but no, you need to fail. You need to try things out. You yeah. need to see what learns. You need to take those learnings, bring them into the you know your next try. Well, it's very much a company cultural approach too. Right. You know, I've had a, a couple of CIOs who've who've been on recent episodes have talked a lot about the way they've developed kind of a team based approach and the culture and how encouraging it is of people to play around with things. Yeah. Um, do you do anything like? I've I've heard uh, like technology petting zoos and, you know, that sort of thing where you set up an area where people can come and play with more advanced tech tools. Is that something you're into? We've, we've done some tech fairs. I'm not mm-hmm. sure I'd call it a petting zoo or anything like that. But we have done um, tech fairs in order mm-hmm. to share share technology. Mm-hmm. Um, we've done that within the IT organization. Um, we've actually done some, at I would say, at different site levels in order for our business users to get familiar with you know what mobile technologies and yeah. up and coming things in that area mm-hmm. so we've done that the other thing that we've done which I think is really cool is we have um, set up what we call lab 82 and lab 82 is you know named after the year Adobe was born mm-hmm. 1982 and it's an innovation lab where we actually test out different technologies that will hit the workplace okay. so it could be you know different forms of whiteboards or 360 degree conferencing mm-hmm. solutions or even the the format and shape of tables for better collaboration oh, and there is exactly where we want to fail fast because what we mm-hmm. don't want to do is you know buy a bunch of technology and roll it out to a whole building and then find out, well, this doesn't really work the way that we thought it would. Yeah. So we bring, you know, people can reserve this Lab 82 to have different types of collaborative meetings and different sessions, mm-hmm. and we observe them and see how they use the technology or maybe they don't use the technology and then that's a fast fail and it gets out of the organization. Well, I know um, GE is doing a lot of this. I've talked with various GE CIOs and they undertook an entire, I I think it's their lean approach. I can't remember exactly what they call it, but it's they, uh, it, it has to do with agile and it also, all the projects you have to go out and get customer feedback. Mm-hmm. Like they're creating a new refrigerator, for instance, and they try it out and they, they, you know what are they called the the most valid uh, the most viable products yeah you get the MVP out there and then it's almost always a surprise and sometimes a shock the actual customer feedback because you're giving them something that you thought they always wanted and it turns out they want that thing instead yeah I can know? I can see that and that's why yeah. you know the I would say kind of the old way of working of getting everything done and perfect yes it, it's it's not today right yeah. I would say that consumers people are more tech savvy mm-hmm. they have higher um, expectations and demands so get the ideas out there and try them and see really what works yeah. and what doesn't work well and and companies like Apple are famous for that mm-hmm. you know everybody raves about the iPad and the iPhone and they forget all about the Apple Newton Yes, right. It was a huge, <laughs> huge disaster, right? Right, that's but right. But look what it led to, yeah. you know, and it, it's that sort of approach. And uh, we're down to the last few minutes here, and I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, kind of your own approach to leadership, mm-hmm. the future of the CIO role. Uh, you've been, this is your third CIO position now, mm-hmm. your third role. What have you learned along the way that makes you a better CIO today? So I think along the way, you know, learning, um, you know, it's not about the technology. It's really about the people. It's Mm -hmm. about relationships. Mm -hmm. That really matters. So um, I spend a lot of time with my staff. 
Um, you know, mm-hmm. I listen to them. I think it's really important to hear what they have to say. They're the pulse of the organization, yeah. and they actually do all the work. I like to say that I'm just kind of mm-hmm. this, you know, facilitator that gets You're them the what they need, <laughs> right? But they actually do all the hard mm-hmm. lifting. So that's that's one area. And then relationships with the business, relationships with customers, mm-hmm. um, you know, really strong. The outside in view, I would say, is critical. You know, really focusing outside in and ensuring that you know what the customers, who your customers are, you yeah. know, where they're going with their businesses so that you can prepare your organization for that into the future. Mm-hmm. Excellent. And when you think about the future and where the CIO role is heading, do you think ultimately everyone will be in CIO plus roles? It's just, Um, it's a very big job anyway. And there's sometimes I talk to CIOs and they're like, how am I going to take on another job when this is already a pretty huge job? Um, But of course, that depends on how well you're training your team and whether you're mentoring for the people behind you to come up and take over some of those. Yeah, I think it's a natural extension of the of the CIO role yeah. to have more responsibility, especially when it gets into some of the operational areas, sure. right? Because the technology with that into end view, mm-hmm. it touches all the operations within the company. Yes. It turns out the CIO helicopter is a good place to be. It is. It's <laughs> one of my favorite places to be. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, let me see. I think um, I think we are right at about time. I had one more question I wanted to ask you. Um, We've talked, we've mentioned a few times the customer journey. Mm -hmm. When you talk about that, what do you mean exactly? And how has that changed? How do you view it differently than you might have, say, two years ago when you joined Adobe? So the customer, I talk about the customer journey. um, It would be from the time an individual or a company Mm -hmm. is a potential you know, they don't even, you know, they're not even an Adobe customer or Mm -hmm. whoever customer right now. And then, you know, there's this whole life cycle of the customer all the way through to, you know, using, buying the product, using Mm -hmm. the product, all the way to supporting and then nurturing the relationship. Mm -hmm. In the past, I think um, the customer has been thought about in silos, you know, there's the sales cycle. Oh, yeah. Okay, there's mm-hmm. the um, there's the actual support cycle. The actual cycle in the middle, you know, of how you're actually using and engaging the product, I would say it hasn't really been thought of in the past, but that's one of the most exciting areas for me. Okay. Because, you know, it used to be, let's, you know, let's work with a customer and automate all the processes to get them on board, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. then let's automate all the support. There's this whole middle piece of engaging with the company during you know during that time frame that you know is just rich for opportunity yeah well and it turns you into more of a partner with them rather than a vendor to them that's right yep. that's right and it's the ongoing communication mm-hmm. ongoing usage how they're how they're engaging you talked about the refrigerator yeah. right <laughs> how do they use that refrigerator and you know what kind of features can you add in to increase your customer loyalty yes. over that period of time yeah when you think back a few years who would have thought that you'd expect to get ice and a drink of water out of the front of your fridge. That's right. And now it's kind of a standard. Yes, so. yes. So yeah. I would like my refrigerator yeah. to tell me everything that's going to expire. Uh-huh. <laughs> so that well, I can use close. it in a recipe, right? I'll bet, I'll bet you're probably going to hear from several refrigerator manufacturers who have that capability today because oh, that is coming right along. Good. Well, thank you very much. It's been delightful talking with you today. And if you are joining us late for this uh, wonderful conversation with Cynthia Stoddard, the CIO at Adobe Systems, and you'd like to watch the full episode, and we cannot blame you for that. It's a fabulous episode. You can find this posted tomorrow on CIO.com, and the audio podcast will be made available within the next 24 hours or so on iTunes, Google Play, and SoundCloud. And I hope you will also join us for the next episode of CIO Leadership Live, which will be on Thursday, June 7th at 4 o'clock in the afternoon Eastern Time. And I will be talking with James Rinaldi, who is the CIO and the Director of IT at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Thanks very much for joining us today, and we will see you again soon.